Good morning. Welcome to Prepare the Way with Pastor Mark Driscoll here. Glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, we are looking in the book of First Thessalonians. Uh, how do we, you know, it has so much to say about the gospel, about ministry, about how you, how you live the Christian life. This is a letter I think every church ought to just dig into. It's got some great stuff for the church, for God's people. You know, I, I, I believe this letter is more focused on the people in the church than the people outside, which I want everybody to hear. But but God has some stuff to say. Uh, you know, today, before we pray, I just want to say that um, there's a lot going around in our world today about um, the church. You know, the church is going through some trying times. The church is, is looking at itself. I believe that, that God is causing us to take a look in our, into ourselves and think about who we are as his people. And that's an important thing to do. Sometimes you really do have to look at yourself and as a body and think, what are we doing? How, what are we doing with the gospel? What are we doing as a church? And I think this letter is really helpful for that. Um, if you're a church leader, I, I encourage you just to dig into this thing. Um, and just re and teach it, teach out of it, because it's it's just got so much that we need to know today. One of the issues today is uh, is what does it mean to be a church leader? We have people who are saying, "I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher," and that you know, and those those gifts and callings we can debate. Um, there's different perspectives on are there still apostles today? Are there still you know? Like kind of, I'm not going to enter that debate today. But I do believe that there are people claiming to be apostles um, that aren't doing what the apostles did. And so part of this is kind of a little pushback to those who, who would claim to be apostles. And it's also an encouragement to those who are leading and calling, how do we lead? How does God call us to lead the church? And now if you're, you're saying, well, I'm not a church leader. Yeah, but you know what to look for, don't you? You know, as a church member, as a church a person in the church, uh, look at look at what leadership ought to look like. Uh, pray for your leaders that they will get a biblical vision for for leadership, and they'll they'll walk in that. Now, what I'm about to share isn't the only biblical vision for leadership, but it has some good things to say, and so I want to share some of that. How do I know uh, that I'm that I'm leading? as God would have me to lead. Uh, this is an issue that's coming up in my life and in the lives of people around me. Uh, what does it really mean to be a leader, to be a minister of the gospel? And if you're calling yourself an apostle, you know, are you doing what the apostles did? Um, but let's take a look at that. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this day, for your love. Thank you for your presence and your care. Lord Jesus, help us. None of us are worthy. None of us get everything right. Uh, Lord, help us to learn how to lead and how to follow and how to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul is writing in 1 Th Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, we talked about revival. He In chapter 1, he described this great move of God that happened in the Greek city of Thessalonica. Um, you know, it was powerful. He talked about the work of the Spirit and conviction and godliness and holiness and the, the centrality of the gospel itself. And in chapter 2, though, he gets to talk about his own ministry. He kind of focuses in on himself. You know, Paul was the latest of the apostles. And so he, he says, but let me describe to you what my ministry was. I'm not sure why he did that. It may have been that there were those criticizing his ministry, those who were calling him into question. It may have been that he just wanted to set forth an example of what an apostolic ministry looks like. Now, you, like I said a minute ago, you can debate whether there are apostles today um, or not. And, uh, but, you know, there are those with an apostolic calling. In, in other words, a missionary calling. A calling to fulfill the Great Commission in a in a unique and powerful way, and so uh, even if you don't believe in apostles per se today, there are people who have an apostolic type calling on their life, and and so different churches look at that in different ways. And I'm really not interested in arguing that, um, but I do want us to look at what does what does an apostle look like in the New Testament text, because quite frankly. A lot of people who are claiming to be apostles today 
or claiming to have apostolic calling today are living in such a way that is exactly in deep contrast to what we see in the scripture. You know, when you've got people running around in diamonds and gold and flying in jets and owning things and, and just being like celebrities who, who have to have a five-star hotel or they just won't show up, charging exorbitant amounts of money just to, for the privilege of letting them come and speak and all this kind of crazy stuff, and then just em enforcing their own authority on people and just squishing people down and, and, and all this kind of stuff, and it, it just it just looks like, wait a minute, that's not what we see the apostles in the New Testament doing. Now, there's authority there, sure. There's places of leadership and correction and, and times when apostles have to exercise some authority. But there's not this kind of thing we're seeing today. And so I want us to, to put the microscope on this and think, what is it that really is apostolic? Because some of you might be listening to someone who's claiming to be an apostle. And uh, I want you to look closely at what the scripture says about it and put that next to that person and say, is this person uh, living what this text is saying? Let's, take, let's dive in. In verse 1, Paul begins, You yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. I love that. Paul says, you know what? You guys know. It, it was, it's evident. You know one of the things about apostolic ministry? It's evident. He says, you, you guys, you know. And here's what I mean. If you have to convince people that you have an apostolic ministry, you don't have one. If you have to convince people that you're a prophet, you're not one. If you have to force your way into ministry so people will recognize you, you are not walking in the calling of a ministry. Because what happens, how do we get leaders in the church? The church recognizes leadership. It's, a, it's not a leadership somebody shows up in the church and says, Hey, I'm a leader. I just wanted you to know. The church looks at people and says, You know what? You're a leader. You know what? You're a leader. I had people come to me as, as a young man and say, I can, see, I can see God using you in this place and using you in this area. And I do this with young people today. If I see giftings in people, I'll tell them. I'll tell, if I see something of, of the Spirit of God on somebody or something of a gift, I'll tell people. I say, look, I'm not the only one you need to talk to, but I'm seeing something. The church, leadership comes out of the church. It doesn't come upon the church. Buddy, that's something right there. True apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral leadership is not something that one imposes on a group of people. It's something that that group of people recognize and they call it out. That's why he said, you yourselves know that our coming to you was not in vain. All you've got to do is pay attention. And then he gives evidence. Listen to this. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know. There he goes in, as you know. I love how many times the apostles use the phrase, as you know. Because what that tells us is that they are not speaking something these people didn't already know. And I'm going to tell you, you know, a true leader, Here, this is important, a true spiritual leader will honor the presence of, the, of God in the lives of their people. You look at that person and say, hey, look, you know this is true. You know God. You know his word. You know the Spirit. If I come into a church and act like I'm the only person that knows God, i got a problem. If I go into a church, and sometimes young ministers will take a pastorate, and the reason, and they'll fail miserably, because they act like they're the only person who's ever prayed or read their Bible. They act like they're the only person who knows anything about the Spirit of God. Now, I know you're called to lead, and you probably know a little bit more than the average person in your group. But you've got to learn to honor the Spirit of God in other people. You've got to look at your people and say, you already know this. You know some stuff, right? I've got to believe there's people in my church, they know some stuff. In fact, there's people in there who know a lot more than I do. There's some people that know the Word. They know God. They know prayer. They know ministry. And if I come in like the celebrity expert, who's the only person that knows anything, then I am not being apostolic. Apostolic can honor the presence of God in another person. Uh, apostles don't need to be celebrities, and they don't need to be the Lone Ranger. They don't need to be the only person in the know. Um, it's, it's really distressing to try to work with somebody who thinks they're the only one who has the Holy Spirit. Um, 
they're the only ones who's ever read their Bible. Um, and, and so, and I see that as a condescending kind of thing. Apostles aren't condescending. But let's move on. He said, But although we had already been suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Apostolic ministry or any kind of leadership, um, they don't let the pain of the past keep them from preaching the gospel in the present. It, that Paul had been shamefully treated at Philippi. He had been falsely accused, thrown in prison, beaten, and then escorted out of town before he came to Thessalonica. He said, but even though we'd been through that, and even though there was conflict in Thessalonica, we preached the gospel boldly. True apostolic ministry preaches the gospel boldly in all circumstances. You don't wait until everything is perfect for you before you preach. You know, you're not a celebrity. You're not somebody who has to have a, a five-star hotel on a perfect stage in an auditorium and, and all the millions of people around you and they have to pay a certain amount and everything's perfect and then you'll preach the gospel. The true apostolic person preaches the gospel in all circumstances. and They, they don't wait for perfect conditions. And they don't, they don't let the pain of the past keep them from preaching in the present. That's a serious idea right here. There's a lot of wounded ministers who are about to give up because you got hurt in the past. But friend, your healing will come not because you, you run away, but because you stand firm, you stay in God, you stay in the secret place, and you keep preaching the gospel even in the midst of much affliction. That's what Paul did. That's what the other apostles did. And, uh, and so sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you don't want to preach. Listen, I, I've had days when I was so beat up I didn't want to stand at that pulpit. But you know, you have to get up and you have to do it. And let God bring the healing. Let God bring the... the... Now, that doesn't mean you don't need time away sometimes. God will let you know when you need that. I'm just saying that if you're always waiting for perfect conditions before you preach, you're not doing the apostolic task. Now, here's the other thing. And Paul goes on in verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity, or any attempt to deceive. True apostolic preaching is biblically accurate, biblically solid. Um, I, 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 I cringe sometimes at what I hear people claiming to be apostles preach weird stuff that has no theological depth to it at all. Paul's preaching was theologically strong. It was grounded in the tradition of the church and in the Word of God and in intimacy of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was not some flighty kind of, oh, let me take a piece of a verse and run off with it and create a new doctrine. He preached the deep truths of the gospel. He talked about justification by faith, redemption, the blood of the cross, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, holiness, righteousness, faith. He didn't, he didn't come up with little fantasies based on pieces of scripture. He preached the deep stuff. No errors here. He was biblically true. And then it says impurity. He didn't preach for money. Now, I'm okay. You know, it's okay if a preacher gets paid, but if you're preaching for money, you don't need to be preaching. Uh, Preaching for other impure motives, for politics, for political gain. Do you preach so you can you can move up a ladder politically? Then that's impure. That's that's not purity. And so, um, if I'm preaching in order to move myself up, that's an impure motive. And then it goes on. Or any attempt to deceive, friend, you don't have permission to lie to people and to misrepresent the truth. You don't you don't have permission to to try to make things look better than they are. And I've had to be called to task on this. There have been times when I have exaggerated. I've spoken beyond what was actual. And I've had to pull back and say, wait a minute. I, I've got to, I, I can't do that. Right? And so that's part of maturity is learning to speak the truth plainly. Just tell the truth. Um, you know, and so here's the thing. Uh, we're not here to deceive people. We're not here to speak half-truths. We're not here to speak just enough truth to get our, our, our point across, but tell the truth, the whole truth, right? Like they say in court, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. And I think that's a great thing for a preacher to say on their knees, Lord, I promise, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, right? 
And so here's the thing. Then verse 4. Um, I think this is an important key here. Verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. Friend, underline that, highlight it, put it on your wall. This is super important. This is really the summary of everything. First of all, it says, just as we've been approved by God. You know, the first thing an apostolic person knows is that God has called them, that they have been called by the grace of God. Paul told Timothy, he said, he has called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. You know, my approval is grounded in God, not in my audience. It's not grounded in my denomination. It's not grounded in the people around me. It's grounded in God. And one of the biggest crises that ministers sometimes have is that we are still looking for approval with everybody else except God. When I finally believe that God himself has called me and has approved of me, and I decide that's really all that matters, suddenly I am free to preach the whole counsel of God without worrying about who it's going to offend or who's giving to the church or any of those kind of things. It's, it's who, what is, has God sent me? Sometimes the only thing that keeps a person in ministry, things get hard. Things get conflicted. Things get difficult. Church, I don't think you realize what your pastor goes through sometimes. And things get tough. And sometimes your pastor, I'm going to tell you the truth, sometimes your pastor, I'm talking about your pastor, is so beat up and so tired and so discouraged that the only reason they keep going is because they know God called them. Now, that's not always true, but sometimes you can, it can get there. And so what does that mean? That I need to be sure of my call. I need to be sure that it's grounded in God. My identity is grounded not in my preaching, not in my ministry, but in God. And so there are times in my own prayer life I've had to back up and say, God, before I'm a preacher, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I belong to Jesus. And if I didn't have another sermon, if I didn't have another church, if I didn't have another speaking engagement, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. And if it all gets stripped away, I'm taking up my cross and following him. And so that, that's where you get that identity. And then it moves on. It says, to be entrusted with the gospel. You know, what a privilege, what an honor that God has entrusted the greatest message in all of human history into the hands of his messengers. That we have been entrusted by God. God is saying, I don't have to trust you, but I have chosen to trust you. Not because I need you, but I want you. And I've called you for my own purpose and grace. And he has, Paul used the word entrusted many times in reference to the gospel. Pastor, evangelist, teacher, whatever your title, or if you don't have a title, listen here. You've been entrusted with the greatest news the world has ever known and the news the world needs the most. You've, it, it's in your hands. And so, so what does that mean? That, and then it said, so we speak. In other words, we speak as those entrusted by God and approved by God. So, minister, the thing that will really help your preaching the most is not some app or some artificial intelligence. I'd rather have genuine holiness than artificial intelligence. Here's the thing. It's knowing that God called you and that God has entrusted his word to you. If you let that get to the bottom of your heart and you let that be the reality in which you minister the gospel, friend, that's a game changer. That is such a game changer. If you're still thinking that you need the world's permission to preach the gospel. If you're still hanging your, your call on somebody else's approval list, and this is so relevant. Uh, you have no idea how relevant this is right now. If, you, if you're doing that, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. There's a lot of young people coming up wanting to preach. That's great. That's awesome. Let me tell you something. You get your approval from God. And you realize that God has entrusted you with his message. And when you realize that, it's a game changer. It'll make you bolder. It'll make you freer. It'll make you more humble. It'll make you holy. It'll make you truthful. It'll make you careful and prayerful. 
And so make sure that's where you're grounding it in. And then it says, the last part of that verse, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Listen to bottom line. Paul wrote this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Am I seeking to please man or Christ? If I'm seeking to please man, I'm not serving Christ. That's hardcore. That is serious. He said he didn't make a he didn't say you could do a little of both, did he? He made it an either or. This is an ultimatum. Either I'm going to seek to please God or I'm going to seek to please people. He did not make any in between. Now, sure, we want to be sensitive to the needs of people and sensitive to culture, sensitive to context, and, and sensitive to those kinds of things so that we don't needlessly injure people. We're not here to beat up the sheep, okay? But here's the thing. We're called to focus what, at the end of that message, at the end of that message, the question should not be, did they like it? At the end of the message, the question should be, did God like it? Did I carry out my commission? Did I speak what was given to me? You know, when I really began to take that seriously a few years ago, I mean, I've always tried to do that, but a few years ago, the Lord really seemed to just hone in on that and say, look here, you're either going to preach for me or preach for them. You need to make a choice. And, and, and I don't know that it happened in one moment like that, but gradually I began to realize, you know what, I've got to make a decision. I'm either going to preach the gospel in a way that focuses on what my Lord wants me to say, or I'm going to preach it in a way that gets good uh, response from my people. If I gauge my success on response, I'm going to quit soon. I'm going to quit easy. But if I gauge my, my success on whether or not I spoke what God gave me to speak, I don't care if they threw rocks at me. God, I said what God told me to say. And so he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I'm living for. That's what I'm preaching for. That's what I'm calling for. And all that is not, I'm not saying that so I can talk about me. I'm using myself as an example. There's a lot of preachers that have the same heart. A lot of Your pastor probably has the same heart. Your pastor probably spends all of his or her time uh, saying, God, what's your word? What do you have to say? And so if your pastor says something that hurts your feelings, if it's grounded in the truth of God, and if it's accurate, and if it's pure, and it came from God, then you need to be listening to what's being said. Now, I know sometimes we preachers, we can get brash and, and we can get in the flesh and we can say things needlessly hurtful. Yes, we can. I've done it. Um, and, I, and I pray God's forgiveness and mercy for those times I've done that. And so here's the thing. Uh, we can do it. We can do it. I'm proof. It can happen. But here's the thing. The more we, we stay anchored in the Word and the more we stay anchored in what the Word has to say, the safer we are from needlessly injuring the sheep, needlessly injuring our hearers. But here's the thing. Now, you might say, well, preacher, you're talking to all a bunch of preachers. Listen, I'm talking to you too. Because when you go to work today, you're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody. When, you, when you're out, out and about doing business, you're going to have an opportunity to speak truth to somebody. And you need to think the same way. You need to think, I'm here to speak what God gives me to speak. If it's a word of... Compassion, speak it. If it's a word of correction, speak it. If it's a word of faith, encouragement, speak it. Speak it. And let God take care of the results. So here's the thing. That verse, um, and then at the end, God who tests our hearts. God is always testing the heart. He's always testing the heart, of his, especially of his ministers. And he's saying, look, what's in your heart? Because God's interested in the condition of the heart. It's, it's that renewed heart, that forgiven heart, that clean heart, that heart that's devoted to him. That's what God's looking for. He's not as interested. Listen, I believe that God would rather have a poor oratory speaker with a heart of fire for him than a polished, um, pompous, uh, self-absorbed celebrity who is all about themselves and can, can't really see beyond the next poll or survey and so here's the thing we've got to we've got to work with this now Paul goes on to describe the rest of his preaching he says for we never came with words of flattery as you know or a pretext for greed God is witness in other words we didn't come to tell you what you want to hear I'm I'm so weary of these and, and preachers that all they want to do is please the crowd and they will twist the scripture or completely neglect it to get the people coming. But boys and girls, here's what the problem is. 
I know some of y'all are doing this from a good heart. You're saying, you know, we don't want to say anything that will keep the lost people away because we want them to come. I totally get that. But here's the problem. Sooner or later, you're going to have to tell them the truth. And what are you going to do then? What are you going to do when they've been coming for months because you've been telling them they're okay, everything's fine, we're not going to talk about sin, we're not going to talk about repentance, we're not going to talk about the cross, we're just going to talk about all the good stuff that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Someday they're going to be sitting there and it's going to be time to say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ what are you going to do when you finally have to get around to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus? What are you going to do when you finally have to admit that everything's not as okay as you've been telling them? You're going to really be hurting because suddenly they're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, where'd this come from? Friends, be front, front loaded, front load the truth. Front load the truth, don't back load it. Front load the truth. Speak the truth plainly. When Paul went into Thessalonica, he said, we didn't come in with flattery or a pretext for greed. We weren't looking for your money. Nor did we seek glory from people. There we go again. Whether from you or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. You know, there's an apostolic authority that Paul said, we could have demanded that you put us up in a nice place. We could have demanded that you give an offering. I get well, who are these preachers giving an offering and they say, you didn't give enough, let's pass the plate again. What in the world are you trying to do? Listen here, but that's another story. Here's the thing. Paul said, we could have demanded that stuff from you. We could have made all kinds of demands. But, here, here it goes. We were gentle among you. Like a nursing mother taking care of her children. So affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. Guys, the heart of an apostle is the heart of Jesus. It's a heart of compassion. It's a heart that wants to nurture. You know, if you're, if you're an apostle and people can't ask you questions without you blasting them, if you're an apostle and you can't sit down next to somebody who's grieving and just be with them and hold their hand, if you're an apostle, and you can't sit down and patiently care for people that are struggling with sin because you're too busy zooming off to your next engagement. Or you're too busy blasting past them and, and, and attacking them with the barrage of Bible verses, but you can't just sit down and, and listen to a broken heart. Then you've got some stuff to work on, preacher. Because we're not here just to blast people with the truth. The truth of God is not meant to be a weapon against people. Yeah, well, it's a sword, but that sword is against the devil, against the lies of the enemy. That sword is not to be used against people. That sword is a healing balm that is to be put on the brokenness and the hurt and the wounds, even if it means I've got to call you to repentance. I've got to do it with love. I've got to do it with love. And, and sometimes we forget that. I forget it sometimes. Sometimes I get all full of my own steam and I'm all about it, you know. And let me tell you the truth and I don't care what anybody thinks. And, and I realize I'm getting into the flesh when I do that. i got to back up. I have to slow down and think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not here to beat up the sheep. I'm here to feed the sheep. I'm here to beat the devil. Now, if the devil shows up, I'm going to slap him silly with this book, right? But I don't want to slap the people with it. And even when you have to tell the culture to repent of their sins, you do it with love. You don't do it with a hateful spirit. You don't do it with a arrogant, you know, uh, let me let me just just shove it down your throat. And and I have fallen into that. I'm I'm not without sin here and I ask God to forgive me. And you may have even heard me be a little bit more harsh than I ought to be in dealing with things. And I and I I'm working on that. I truly am because I, I that's not the way to do it. But we're called to speak the truth in love. And and this is what God calls us to do. Jesus always spoke the truth in love. Even confronting the Pharisees, he did it with, with, a, with a heart that loved them. He was frustrated and he was angry, but he loved them. And he was calling them to repentance. And, and he, he was focused on that. 
At the very end, it says, because you had become very dear to us. True apostolic ministry loves the people. Do you love your people? Preacher, just let me ask you a question. Do you love your people? Do you love them? Sometimes I need to slow down on the preaching rhetoric and just spend time loving my people. A pastor that can't spend time with their people because they're too busy uh, preparing for their next performance. They're too busy uh, promoting their image. They can't just go and visit the elderly and the hurting and the broken and the sick. It's somebody who's missing a large part of what God called us to do. We've got to love our people. We've got to love our people. And people in the, in the pews, we've got to love each other. We've got to be concerned about those around us because they've become very dear to us. Paul said, our hearts were with you. We love you. He, and he used the term of a mother with her children. Uh, the compassion, the nurture, the protection, the, the care. And yes, the discipline and all the things. But it's all done out of a heart of love. And the real the heart of an apostle is not the heart of a celebrity. It's the heart of a servant who loves God and loves people. And that really brings it down to the bottom of it. Jesus loved his heavenly father and he loved people. That's the pattern we follow. Paul said, you guys, we have, we loved you. And, and you know, and he goes on to describe that in the, in the next verses. But I'm going to stop here. I think we're going to focus on the last part of this uh, next time together. Listen, I pray that you're experiencing the love of God in a powerful and life-changing way. And I pray that uh, you, you would trust the Lord Jesus Christ who loved you enough to die for you but rose from the dead on the third day but calls you to repentance and faith to trust in Him. I pray that you know Him today. And I pray that you as a minister of the gospel, you're encouraged today that God has approved you, He has entrusted you, and He has called you. But now, let's, let's carry the gospel as those approved and entrusted by God who don't need the approval of man, but we need the approval of God. God bless you. Go in peace.